Welcome to the fourth season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you are a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. We're back this week with a new episode. And we'd like to give out a heartfelt thank you to our listeners for your patience over the last few months. We appreciate your support. Now let's get to this week's true crime episode. Please note this episode contains details and facts that some listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Originally from Sir Goinesville, Tennessee... Joel Guy was a single dad with three daughters when he met Lisa, the love of his life. The couple both had a great sense of humor and loved the outdoors and became inseparable. Each had found their soulmate. Residing in Knoxville, Lisa was a stay-at-home mom while Joel worked in civil engineering. She became a beloved stepmom to his daughters and the blended family went on to have a son, Joel Jr., born in March 1988. Jewel Jr. attended a school for gifted students and went to the Louisiana School for Math Sciences and the Arts. At school, he made a number of friends, including Michael McCracken, and the two became best friends. Jewel graduated high school in 2006 and attended a semester at George Washington University before moving to Baton Rouge and attending Louisiana State University. Joel and Michael were often roommates in university, but over the next 10 years, Joel's behavior slowly started to change. At school, he became socially awkward and withdrawn, and sometimes weeks would go by with Michael never seeing him. Joel's family was close-knit. His sisters, father, and Lisa often communicated through group text messages, but Joel never included himself in the group. He was withdrawn from his sisters, and while Joel and Lisa enjoyed their six grandchildren, Joel Jr. didn't even know their names. Joel Sr. and Lisa lived in the family home in Golden View Lane, and kept their son's belongings in his childhood bedroom. The room was dotted with pictures of Joel when he was younger and contained his childhood toys. After Joel Jr. finished high school, Lisa went to work in the accounting department in an engineering firm. And during university, Joel never held a job. The couple paid for his education, and Lisa used her paychecks to support him. But in 2013, the couple were growing tired of financially supporting their adult son. Knox News reported that Joel Sr. threatened to cut him off. But they didn't. Lisa continued to work and support their son. In 2015, Joel dropped out of university. He still did not get a job and relied on his parents for financial support. In fact, Lisa continued to help her son and prepaid his rent until next August. The things were about to change for all of them. Joel Sr. and Lisa had been married 31 years and decided it was time for them to retire. In October, they shared their plans with their daughter Michelle and said that Joel Jr. would need to get a job and support himself. The couple purchased Joel's mother's home in Sir Goinesville and planned to move there mid-December. On November 17, Joel Sr. used a family text to tell his daughters they sold the family home. A few days later, Lisa gave her notice to her employer that her last day would be December 2nd, and mentioned to her boss, Jennifer, that it was time for Joel Jr. to stand on his own two feet. His parents planned to inform him at Christmas that they could no longer financially support him. But somehow, Joel Jr. found out early, and he knew he had to do something. 
He had no plans of getting a job, no means of supporting himself, and needed their money. A sinister plan began to form in Joel Jr.'s mind. He was simply doing what needed to be done. No second thoughts, no chance at regret. His plan would have to be carried out quickly. The clock was ticking. His mother's last day at work was only weeks away. Joel Jr. pulled out a black notebook and made a long list of tools he would need. It included knives, a sledgehammer, and plastic sheets. He added notes such as, Turn heater up as high as it goes to speed decomposition. Bring a blender. Get bleach and plastic bins. Flush chunks down the toilet, not the garbage disposal. And wear gloves to prevent fingerprints and DNA. Among his extensive and detailed notes, he wrote, Clean up mess from him before she gets home. Kill her. Then he's not alive to claim her half of the insurance money and all 500000 is mine. On the last page, he detailed his parents' assets. Their house, the vehicles, their boat, Jill's 401k, and Lisa's life insurance. He planned to burn down the house to cover up his crime and made a note to place the hair curler with flammable paper and gasoline in four locations and set a timer for 10 a.m. On November 7th, Joel Jr. began making purchases to carry out his plan and visited Ace Hardware. Four days later, Lowe's. A week after that, Home Depot. Then he made three trips to a sports store. On November 21st, he purchased two blue totes at Walmart. Thanksgiving was fast approaching, and Joel had plans to go home to celebrate the holiday with his parents and three sisters, Angela, Michelle, and Shandies, and their children. Joel arrived on Wednesday, November 23rd, parked his car in the driveway, and took a suitcase upstairs to his old bedroom, where his mother had lovingly packed his childhood toys into boxes. The next morning was Thanksgiving. The day started out early, around 10.30 a.m. Court records reported that when his sister Michelle arrived, she happened to glance into the back of Joel Jr.'s car and saw two blue totes, stacked one inside the other with the lids on top. Jewel Jr. typically stayed confined to his room during family events, choosing solidarity over time with his family. But this year, Joel surprised everyone and came out of his room and spent time with them. It was out of character for him, and Michelle found it odd. What surprised her even more was that when she went upstairs to check on her children, she found them in Joel's bedroom, where he was showing them his toys. After an enjoyable Thanksgiving dinner, the girls and the children headed home. On Saturday, Joel Sr. stayed home while Lisa went grocery shopping at Walmart. She checked out at 12.18 p.m. Meanwhile, Joel Jr. surprised his father in the upstairs exercise room. Joel attacked him by stabbing him. Joel Sr. fought back hard for his life and used his hands to deflect the night blade as it rained down on him over 40 times, blow after blow. Joel Sr. died at 61. Joel proceeded to clean up, then waited for his mother to return. Carrying grocery bags, she entered their home. Perhaps she spotted blood on the wall leading upstairs. Something caused her to head up. At the top, Jill startled her, attacked her with a knife. Thirty-one times he inflicted wounds to her heart, lungs, kidney and liver. Lisa died at fifty-five. 
Joel continued with his plan, and this part is disturbing. For hours, he proceeded to dismember his parents, putting his mother's head in a pot on the stove, and after severing their limbs, placed the remain into two bins in the bathroom, adding chemicals to dissolve them. At some point during the frenzied attacks, Joel had cut himself. At 3.35 p.m., he drove to Walmart and picked up pain relief, alcohol, and antibiotic ointment to treat his wounds. Joel returned to his childhood home, and even though he had meticulously planned out every detail, he couldn't finish the job. He gave up, turned the heat up to 90 degrees, and returned home to Baton Rouge. Renee texted her brother, Joel Sr., over the weekend, but did not hear back. Sunday was Shandice's birthday, and she expected a call from her dad, but no call came. Monday morning, when Lisa did not show up for work at 7 a.m., her boss, Jennifer, became concerned. At 7.15, she texted Lisa. She waited a bit, then texted again. Lisa's co-workers had a retirement lunch planned for her that afternoon, and she knew Lisa wouldn't miss it. She texted Joel Sr. Getting no response, she was alarmed and contacted police to request a welfare check, telling them it was highly unusual for Lisa to miss work. Detective Ballard responded to the call. He drove down Golden View Lane, a quiet dead-end street with mostly two-story homes on large lots. A for-sale sign sat perched on the front lawn. Bushes neatly trimmed formed a line along the front of the house and contrasted against the gray stucco. Vehicles were parked in the driveway that led to a double-car garage. The detective walked up the four cement steps that led up to the front door. To the glass, he could see a light on in the entranceway. He knocked, then rang the doorbell. The officer walked around to the side of the house and spotted a small fenced area with a locked gate. He returned to the front, knocked on the door, and rang the doorbell again, then returned to his vehicle. Ten minutes had passed. That afternoon, Jennifer couldn't shake the uneasy feeling she had. She called police again and insisted they do another welfare check. This time, Detective Beller took another detective and two officers with him. Detective McCord arrived to see the front door was locked. Through the glass, he could see groceries on the floor. He looked around for a realtor's lockbox. He and the officer started knocking on neighbors' doors and asked when the last time was they had seen Lisa. Meanwhile, a detective determined that the cars in the driveway belonged to Lisa and Joel Sr. and was concerned they may be inside and need assistance. So the detectives climbed the fence into the backyard, up the wooden steps, and onto the porch. There, they could see a hole in the back door, where the doorknob was missing. They touched the glass on the door and felt it unusually warm. Through the hole, they could smell a strange odor. An officer located a garage door opener in one of the vehicles. As the door eased up the track, officers immediately felt the heat. The door between the garage and the house was unlocked. As they entered, detectives announced themselves. The heat and odor assaulted their senses. On the floor sat several containers of chemicals. Nearby on a table was a purse, two wallets, a set of keys, vice grips, and a hammer. 
In the kitchen, they saw the stove was turned on, a large pot sitting on top. On the floor were containers of bleach, muriatic acid, towels, and trash bags. The realtor's lockbox and a doorknob sat in some kind of liquid in the sink. In the dining room, the thermostat at the wall was set to 90 degrees. On the floor near the front door, ice cream lay in a melted puddle. Turning towards the staircase, they spotted a reddish-brown stain on the wall leading upstairs. Officers carefully tread up the stairs. At the top, they saw clothing that had been cut and an empty bottle of drain cleaner and sewer line cleaner, along with a knife and scissors. Looking down the hallway, officers spotted two hands. Just the hands. They retraced their steps and called for backup. When more officers arrived and entered the house, upstairs one of them heard a sound coming from the master bedroom and discovered a heater turned on to its highest setting. Piled on the bedroom floor were two black trash bags, a container of drain line opener, hydrogen peroxide, and a large roll of clear plastic, among many other items. In the bathroom, the floor was covered in a plastic sheet. A pair of plastic gloves were on the floor, while a knife rested on the sink. Two blue plastic tubs sat on the floor, their sides bulging. They peered inside to see a sight none of them will ever forget. Floating in a liquid of some sort was the torso of Joel and Lisa. A detective contacted Jennifer and discovered that Lisa's employment benefits included a $500,000 life insurance policy and that the beneficiaries were Joel Sr. and Joel Jr. with an equal 50-50 split. Crime scene investigators discovered large amounts of blood evidence throughout the house. On the walls, floors, scissors, knives, and clothing. DNA mingled with Joel Sr., Lisa, and Joel Jr.'s. And under Joel Sr.'s fingernails was the blood and DNA of Joel Jr. In Joel Jr.'s bedroom, they discovered his backpack. Inside were several items, including books with Joel's name written on them and that black notebook with his handwritten list for murder. In the upstairs bathroom, they found a Walmart receipt for Joel Jr.'s first aid purchases, and video surveillance confirmed he was the one who made the purchase. Further investigation would locate receipts and video surveillance detailing a shopping list of murder supplies. A warrant was issued for Joel Jr. He was arrested leaving his apartment on November 29th, just three days after he ambushed and brutally murdered his parents. His body was bruised and his hands were cut. His vehicle was impounded and inside the trunk they found a large red gas can and a meat grinder. Joel was charged with two counts of first-degree murder, three counts of felony murder, and two counts of abuse of a corpse. Joel Jr. went to trial in September 2020, where he did not testify and never showed an ounce of remorse. In fact, he seemed amused by the proceedings. The prosecution's evidence was extensive. Within a few hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty on all four counts. The judge sentenced him to a total of 124 years. He will be eligible for parole after 51 years. Joel Jr. appealed his conviction, but it was denied in March 2023. 
Before his trial began, Joel Jr. requested that if he was found guilty, the court sentence him to death. But that would not be possible as the prosecution did not seek the death penalty. Joel will eventually get the death he seeks. Until then, he will reside within the concrete walls of a prison cell, his evil restrained by steel bars. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Dorothy Stratton. Paul saw beautiful 18-year-old Dorothy as he is ticket to financial success and helped her become a centerfold. Then on the cusp of becoming a movie star, she was ready to move on without him. He couldn't let that happen. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. We love what we do and are dying to continue. If you enjoy listening to Murder in 20 every week, we'd be eternally grateful for your support by visiting Murder in 20 at Patreon, PayPal, or murderin20.com. We'd like to acknowledge Verbal Planet for use of their music sound effect from Fasting Studios and Quick Sounds, and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. <laughs>